everybody, and welcome to today's installment of EPAC Quarantine Chats. Now, today I have a very special guest, and we're going to be talking a lot about EPAC uh, in the next hour or so. Um, I have Mr. Dave Dierwechter, who has been the board, has been a member of the board before I even got here. Okay, so we're talking ancient history. And uh, he's actually served as the board president twice, and he has been, I think he's the last person left Besides me, I think we're the old timers. We have been involved in EPAC, I think, more than anybody else. So welcome, Mr. Deerwechter. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for doing this. We're going to have a lot to talk about because of the history of EPAC. Um, uh, and um, you know the history uh, probably better than anybody else. You were there. You were <laughs> in the room. Um, <laughs> and, um, but first, let's talk about you. Now, you are a uh, Lancaster boy, right? You're born and bred, right? Am I correct in that? Yeah, born and bred in Ephrata, right. Okay, yeah, oh, born and bred in Ephrata. And how did you get associated with the Playhouse? With the, what, you know, what we still call the Playhouse? The Playhouse, right. Oh, oh I guess I was still called the Playhouse. How did you get involved with EPAC? Well, I got involved um, through my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, Back in the, I was in, in uh, high school and uh, my parents attended theater at, uh, with old John Cameron mm -hmm. uh, when it was the Legion Star Playhouse. And uh, I went along with them for several shows, got interested in it that way. I had a good friend who joined the cast of one of the, one of the summer seasons because John used equity players, but then he also cast locally too. And mm -hmm. he was in high school, his name is Bill Jobes, and he um, got hired for a summer at the Playhouse with John Cameron. So I would you know, go down to see him, I'd nuts around with him, hang around with him. So basically I would, by the time that I left for college, I already had seen lots of shows there uh work i i didn't do any acting or anything else like that but i was running around the place helping out wherever i could doing this that and the other thing and off i went to uh, millersville and came back uh, from millersville taught in Ephrata. so one of the first things i did when i came back was got a subscription mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's been been uh, part of it ever since Wow. Now, you have directed at EPAC. Yes. You also... Main stage and children's theater. Main stage and children's theater. Right. Yes. Um, I know in our conversation, all this is going to start coming back. To me. Like, <laughs> didn't, you, weren't you, didn't you do a show with little Bob Bonner when he was a kid? Narnia? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Um, and then you, but you also served. Is it twice as president of the board? Twice, yes. Twice. twice as president of the board, but I've been on and off the board for as long as I can remember. Yeah. I was either okay. more than off, right? Yes. I mean, and, and if I wasn't on the board as an official member, I was member of the development committee. Yep. Or yep. I was uh, chairing special events, and so kind of when I was an official board member and when I was just a part of the organization, kind of blurs. Yeah, yeah. Started and the other ended. <laughs> yeah, you have been there through it all, basically, yes. it all. Um, and I will tell, we're gonna get into the history because it's rich <laughs> history. Um, but um, in the late 80s, early 90s, which we'll get into, when EPAC started to change and become what is artistically what we are now, what our niche is, what we are known for, was a lot uh, responsible uh, of Dave, who wanted to take EPAC in a more daring and artistic uh, road than it had been which we will get into, but there's a few people who really pushed, pushed to make EPAC what it's day, and Dave was one of the people who did that. And so um, EPAC today, if it wasn't for this man, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. 
Oh, thank you. Um, so, but um, Dave, I want to go all the way back now and talk about the history of EPAC because I had actually, I had a, um, a book at the theater and uh, I, and the theater's closed now, so I couldn't access it, but it was actually put out by the Iker Art Center, which is a detailed history of the land, which is mm -hmm. fascinating. Right. And I get back to the theater, it's a theater somewhere, and, but I will uh, remember some of it. And then I was researching when we were renovating in 2003, Marty Crisp did this huge article uh, about the history of the park and the playhouse. Um, and it was fascinating with pictures, and I, I try to research it online, I try to find the article, and I, I can't find it, unfortunately. So, I re but I remember certain facts, which are very interesting about EPAC the park and um, EPAC in general and, and the land. Well, the building that we're in, right, that has been around, did you know, 1870, something like that? Uh, 1734. 17. 1734. Yeah, Daniel Iker was uh, a person who, obviously the Iker building right across from right. your office there. Uh, he was a member of the Cloisters, the old, the old uh, cloister group that was across the creek. Yeah. And he got new land. It was uh, granted by William Penn and moved from the cloisters over to his house was what's now the Indian Museum. That was his house. Mm -hmm. later, later, as over the years, he moved from there to what is now the Iker building. And he started, the family uh, started a farm in the 1800s. And the farm building, the barn, is the theater. So that was actually torn down in uh, 1912, I believe. They tore down the barn, kept the foundation, mm -hmm. and then built what they called the uh, pavilion on top of the original foundation for the original barn. Now, I read, and I think I remember this in reading the history, that originally, and this was before in the 1800s, 1700s, the the foundation of where we are now, the plant was in the middle of what is now the parking lot. Right. Right, yeah, and they moved it. It was, I forget when or how, I think it was before the Legion, but it was moved from the mid, what is now the part, the Legion parking lot or our, our parking lot, we share with the Legion. They moved it to where, to where the theater stands now, but originally that was where the barn was. The right, right. Mm -hmm. so what we, yeah, so we're actually looking at the, when we talk about the original, it's the original foundation you have to kind of like refer to, rather yeah. than the original location. Right, right. Now the the uh, the place we're in now, the uh, the things that survive from the barn or right the trusses, is that correct? And the foundation stone. The yes. Foundation. Yeah, that's the that's what survives from the old the old. At, at one time, I I'd have to research this myself to get remembered exactly. But uh, I remember reading that the building, when it was the playhouse, w had the longest unsuspended structure roof in the country of that type of design, the way the, our, the, way the pillars right. and the roof truss. Because when you stood there at the wall, when you came in the door, you looked straight back through to the shop. There was no pillars. Oh, no, not, no support whatsoever other yep. than the walls. And yep. that had been written up as some kind of a major architectural design that uh, oh. lasted for quite a long period of time. And it's still that way. We still don't have any, any support. Uh, the wall that's uh, behind the um, uh, snack bar, when that was put in, that wasn't put in to hold up the roof. It just happened to be put in there to separate the lobby from the theater. So it's still the same type of design going and now back. Now it's a wall. In the old days, it was just like hard. What's it? Cardboard. It was just some like. Yeah, it was the well. There were curtains hanging behind the back of the seats. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, and um, so, and then when it, in the turn of the century, the Iker Art Center has some beautiful pictures of, of turn of the century. And it was, an, it wasn't never an open air pavilion. It always had a roof, correct? It had flats. Right. But it was always a covered pavilion. And it was, um, uh, they used to have concerts in there, right? It was just like a, a gathering place. Yes, concerts. It was a roller skating rink. It was a community hall. Right. Uh, my father graduated from the old, but was then the effort of high school, 1927. They held their graduation ceremony in there. Wow. Right. Wow. So it was a community building. It was a community building. And um, then um, in, uh, what is it? Then it became, so it stood there, I think during the 30s, the 20s and 30s, it became the roller rink during the Depression. Right. Yeah, and if you go to the, um, the Main Street Theater here in Ephrata, and they still have a lot of memorabilia from the 20s and 30s, from the old Main Theater, what was playing there, and they have advertisements for the Ephrata roller rink from like the 90s. Really? Yeah, you could like, there's one or two of them. If you look, you can see it. Yeah, they have uh, like a mainstream movie theater, Jimmy Cagney and this and blah, 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 double feature Bowery Boys. And then you have a, a picture of two people skating and it advertised the skating rink. So I think that was during the depression. They changed, they they brought in a skating rink, which is like the floor is, it must have been a crazy skating rink because floor is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but. And then, then it became a theater in the, it, was there anything did you know between when it became a theater, I believe in the 50s, early 50s? Early 50s when Cameron came in. Before right. that time, it was basically uh, used as a, I won't exactly say a theater. It was, it was an all-purpose building, so to speak. Right, um, right. Various events were held in there, but it was, at that time, it was owned, uh, the Legion, of course, had it. Mm -hmm. But the borough also had formed a committee to main, to administrate what, what was happening inside there, you know, that sort of thing. Right. So um, it had been a part of the, of the, been a part of the borough of effort. Yeah, in one, way, in one way or the other, right? All those years. Now, there's something before we get to when it was the theater. Uh, a, a, one of the most interesting aspects, and it has to do with of um, of effort was it was the spirit when the spiritualist movement in the 20s mm -hmm. was very big in this country, very controversial and very big in this country. Like Harry Houdini was into it. One of the prime mediums, yeah, I just looked up her name yesterday. Um, one of the prime mediums bought the old Mountain Springs Hotel Resort, which was originally where Applebee's is now. Right, Eth Ethel Parrish. Ethel Parrish, yes. And she was a big time medium spiritualist who later was, she was a fraud, but we won't get into that. <laughs> but, um, she bought the old, it was the Mountain Springs Hotel, which opened up or like, because there was springs up at the top of that mountain. Right. Yeah. yeah was, and advertised, it was a big deal that you drank the waters. Yeah, you drank the waters. And so they held in this, the Mountain Springs Hotel, and there would be a train that would pick you up at the old train station, which is right where I live, right? And it would bring you up the hill to the Mountain Springs. And a lot of people's presidents stayed there, a very, very famous place. Um, then it closed down, and it was a hospital for a while. Which I, was, which I was born in. Were you born in that? Really? Yeah, yeah 1946, when it was a hospital. I was, I was born in that, yes. And then, uh, and then, the, uh, then she, Ethel Parrish, came in, and she turned it into a spiritualist, um, a spiritualist retreat. Right. Camp Silver Bell, which became incredible incredibly famous and people would come mediums spiritualists would come from all over the world there are pictures of supposed ghosts that they conjured up uh, spirits they called them spirits they conjured and if you research it it's really interesting there and they should also, be a documentary about that place they also used the park too 
that's where I was going with this. I'm sorry. Yes, because that's Marty Crisp wrote that, and that's why I was dying to find this article that they use the park in the summer as a spiritualist park. Right. That they'd have a seances. It was Camp Silverbell in the park, as well as that they basically had the park, and they had the uh, uh, the mountains, the old Mountain Springs Hotel. So the spiritualists kind of ran the sound. People don't know that. Um, very interesting. Uh, there are no ghosts. In the, I'm I'm sorry. Everybody <laughs> likes to say they are ghosts, and given the past and. I've, ne I've been there 30 years. I've ne No, it's creepy when you're alone at night, of course, and any building is, any theater is, but I've never seen any ghosts in the playhouse, so I will go on record on, on that. <laughs> but so that was, I thought that's a really interesting part of EPAC history that somebody should really do a documentary on, because that is a really interesting part of, of the spiritual movement. Um, so anyway, then it was in... Uh, it was just a recreation hall, it was a civic meeting place, and then it turned into a theater. So right. tell us about that. Right. Uh, John Cameron, who mm -hmm. was a New York producer and had produced and directed uh, in New York, mostly off-Broadway, uh, lived in Florida in the summer, and he would go back and forth. And I don't know exactly how he ended up finding this property, but he convinced the, at that time it was owned by the Legion, right. um, because the, the place was coming, was falling apart, and uh, Legion did major restoration on the building, and uh, John Cameron came in and convinced the Legion it'd be a great place for a theater. Wait, uh, pause there. Now people should know that the Legion owned the entire park at one time. The, Le the Legion, the whole park, the pool, uh, our building, the Iker building, man, was, man, was, man. yeah, but that was called the Iker building at that time was larger. It had been uh, considerably bigger and was known as the Legion Park Hotel. Wow. So, yes, it was all the Legion's property. And uh, the seats that were in the building that he thought would be great for using the theater came from the old Roxy movie theater which was located down the street from where you live. Uh, the Roxy, uh, I'm sorry, no, the, the Roxy was up the up the street. Um, you know where the, the Effort and National Bank drive-in is? Yes. Okay, there used to be a movie theater in there called the Roxy, and it burned down. And the seats that were in there eventually ended up in the playhouse. Wow. So I, the wooden seats that were in there when, you know, you have there in your apartment. Yeah, those, yeah, those were from the Roxy Theater. Wow. Now, um, Effort at one time had three movie theaters. It had the Roxy. It had the big one, the Main. Main. And then what people don't know is it had a small, the, where the liquor store, where the state store right. is now, there was a small theater that played Westerns primarily. And that was, that was the first one in Effort. What the and, little the one by where the state store is now? Yes, and that had the uh, the piano player with the uh, the silent movies and the piano player in there. Wow! Uh, giving the background music while the movie was going on. Yeah, the Roxy and the Main were owned by the same family. Steve right. was, was the name of the people that owned those two those both of those theaters. Wow! Wow! So Cameron came in, so the Legion had sold off, and you remember, you said that they used to have like big bands come into the park in the summer. The oh, Legion yeah. would have like Glenn Miller and the big, and they would play at the bandstand. They at would the, have concerts. At the band shell. Um, I, yeah. I remember coming to those too. Um, there was no fee. They, they passed the cigar hat around to the audience, and you put money in it as, as a donation, and those were run by the Legion. Wow. I was on a Sunday night. I saw a lot of really good bands down there, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, they were they were named groups. And at, also at that time in the '40s, the Legion itself was a major location for night as a effort as nightclub. They wow. had in the ballroom in there. They brought in in cabarets and comedians, and um, it, it's kind of amazing that effort of 
at one time, like I said, three movie theaters, uh, major name bands in the summer on a Sunday night in the park, mm -hmm. Legion bringing in a, and having a, a major audience on Saturday nights with their program that they had. Mm -hmm. So Ephrata goes way back as far as being mm -hmm. the entertainment capital, so to speak, of Northern Lancaster County. I mean, there was a lot going on around here. You know, I, what people are also in my research, I found out something very, very interesting that Ephrata downtown on a Friday, people would come from Lancaster and Reading to shop. Yes. Downtown Ephrata on a Friday night, it was packed. Yes. Because the prices were good and the goods, the merchants had good prices and the goods were wonderful. So Friday night when the stores would be open late, people would like descend upon effort of downtown. It would be jammed Friday night with shoppers. All the shoppers would open Friday night. Friday was open until nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked at a, a men's clothing store called, My, it was named Michael's Men's Store. Uh, and at that time, effort I had three men's stores, Michael's, Emery's, and Mitchell and Ruth were nothing but men's stores. And they all were busy enough that they had uh, uh, several full-time employees who made their living off of that store. So like when I worked at Michael's, there were in that store, there were three up to four one time, people whose full-time job was in that store weekends Friday night, Saturday, he would bring in a whole bunch of high school and college kids working mm -hmm. part time, myself included. So we had probably at, at one point, maybe 10 people working that little store. And it was, it was packed. It was packed. Yeah, yeah. I hear it was a big shopping area. And yeah. uh, I know in my building, they had a Sears robot catalog store. Of course, okay. when I first Started, I was still in Lancaster. I had moved to Ephrata, but when I first started working in Playhouse in 86, J.C. Penney's was still still across the street from where I live. Right. J.C. Penney's. Here's Roebuck, J.C. Penney, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so then, so we go to the, uh, and then the uh, Legion sold off parcels of land to the borough. So the borough eventually owned the park because the Legion had all this land, and then as time went on, they would sell it. Uh, right back to the borough. But when Cameron came in, I guess what you're telling me is the Legion still owned most, some of the land, including what is now the, the theater, the effort of the program. Right. Um, so, and then he decided he would do what was big at the time, the summer stock. Correct. Correct. We were on the straw hat circuit. Straw hat circuit. For those of you who don't know, summer, summer stock was really, I was talking to Brian about that, because Ephrata was also summer stock. We had F Mount Gretna summer stock, and the Ephrata Performing Arts Center was summer stock, which was theaters that would operate. Most of them were open air theaters that would operate in the summer, and just in the summer, and stars from Broadway, because I think it started because Broadway closed in the summer before air conditioning, because there was no air conditioning, so a lot of shows would take the summer off, and the people who were doing shows, the actors who were doing shows in the winter months and fall and spring on Broadway would do the open air summer to keep working and that became summer stock. And, and he also had a, brought in a lot of TV stars. Yes. Which were probably what? more popular because the majority of your audience would have been watching these folks on TV. Right. And then, the, then they're coming into effort in the summer. Right. I mean, I know for myself, one of the first shows I saw with, that John Cameron did had, uh, see, I'll throw a name at you, see if you, if you know, Hugh O'Reilly. Glassie's dad. Well, Glassie's dad, Jimmy, right. Jimmy's dad. Right. Jimmy owned Glassie and he was glad at Jimmy's dad. And I, I was so impressed. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, saw the, I, I saw Betty White, didn't impress me that terribly much. <laughs> You know, saw quite a few of the others. Veronica Lake, yeah, but Lassie's dad. I just, I was thrilled. <laughs> well, it was yeah, and Everett. I mean, those people who played were incredible. Like we still have some like um, 
uh, Francis Farmer, Veronica Lake, Chico Marx, Everett Horton. You had all these t- people, and they would stay at the hotel. Right. And Jerry Rockwell, who has who was a theater fanatic who's been here, right. he, Historian, as yes. a young kid, his job was to pick them up from the train station and bring them in. And they would stay at the hotel, which was a, which is now the Iker Center across the street. I heard terrible things about that hotel. I take it when this, <laughs> from people who remember it towards the end of the time, I heard it was like really a, a, not a nice place. But when these stars were staying there, I guess it was, it was a nice place, right? Well, well, it was, and they uh, also, since the Legion owned everything, they also got free passes to go to the effort of pool. Oh, okay. So that became a big deal. People would be there at the pool and uh, community members and in would walk, fill in the blank, star from TV, and just hanging out at the pool because they were, the way, they, the way John Cameron operated, uh, it was almost like a resident company and you rehearsed <clears throat> during the day and performed a different show that night. Mm-hmm. So in between in breaks, people head down to the pool. But now, um, when Cameron first came, the theater, which is now 300 seat, it was two, when we, in the, when EPAC first started, it was 200 seats, we renovated it to 300. But when Cameron first came down here, it was theater in the round. It was like 600 seats. Am I correct on that? It, it was it totally was, in the round. Yes. The, the, the whole area that we now call backstage, that was the same size seating as on the center section. Right. And the, the little tiny orchestra pit that held a piano, bass, and drum. I remember that. Right in front of it. Yes, yeah, the bane of our existence of people walking in that thing and worried it was going to fall through. I, I actually, I, I did one show where they actually used it for them. My first forum in 85, 80, was 85, it 80, 85, 85, 86. Yeah, they, they, they still, Kemble Kiki, may you rest in peace, just passed. They still used that little orchestra pit. Um, but it was, compl- were there two sides, were, now, were there, t- it was the, what we call now the north section, right? Right. But that was mirrored on the other side. Like, so you had two north sections there. Now, were there two, like on the side sections, were there two side sections two on each side? Side sections also, right. right. The middle? Wow. Yeah. So it was big. It was a big theater. Yeah, it was basically, I um, mean, when, when we, I think it was, it, I don't think it was 600. I forget the exact old exact. I mean, you figure what you have in the on the center on the north, you duplicate that plus yeah. plus the, the two sides. So probably be about four. Yeah, 450, like that. yeah, four fifty because there would be two hundred, and then if there were two side sections, when I first came there, there was only one area of the side sections left. I think the side sections were like fifty. It was only three rows. Remember, three right. or four rows. It was fifty fifty, so that would be. Uh, a hundred each side. So it's probably it was probably four hundred. Four hundred. And the, then, and you remember the light booth was behind those little seats. Oh, what we call the light booth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, small. You had to change. If you changed your mind, you had to walk out and come back in again. It was the. Uh, <laughs> now, when they started, and it was a five hundred seat theater, that was two shows a night. Yes. You had the early show, which was a Twilight to Sunset show, which was like six o'clock, and it was still hot, so the tickets were cheap. You weren't right. And then you had a break, and then you had the nine o'clock show. Right. And John Cameron used to tell his cast to take it easy on the first one because the people coming in later are going to be paying more money, so you want to give them the better show. <laughs> Now, so people out there who complain that theater starts too late nowadays, I don't know like what everybody wants to start at seven o'clock so they can be home by nine. People came to theater at nine o'clock to see a yeah. show. Nine yeah. o'clock. The show was yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and then you had two shows a night. And I heard that in its heyday when this was going on, people would the lines would be incredibly long. 
get in. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it depended on the show and it, on the star, particularly if he had a if he had a major star that people knew. But, right. Um, yeah, it it uh, it did well, and uh, John and his wife were the total staff, basically. Uh, his wife ran box office. John, of course, produced and directed. John would be walking up and down Main Street selling ads for the program. So basically, it was the two of them. And they would get ushers from uh, the Effort of Women's Club, would come in and help with ushers. But uh, John and his wife, they were the, they were, they were the staff. Oh. You didn't have local interns, Dave, like with kids in the summer. No. No, there no there was there was no children's theater program, nothing for the kids at all in the summer. Mm -hmm. So you had this going on by the start of I think 51, 52. I mean it's early. Early 50, 50s, yeah. Early 50s. Um, and this lasted till 70s, like 20 something years. Yeah, middle 70s. I forget the exact time it was when when he left. Uh, and and uh, that's when the when he left. Then the uh, borough established a committee to kind of just again almost take it back to where it was before. Because uh, the theater had been, I mean, summer stock. The audience had fallen off. Right. Yeah, uh, he stopped using equity actors at one point. Mm -hmm. um, cut corners. The maintenance in the building was zero. I remember stories of people bringing umbrellas to watch shows. Yeah. And buckets all over the theater to catch the rain. Um, so there was, um, so, and he, I hear he left town owing money. <laughs> he did. He did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because I, and I, I, I have no idea how much, but I do know that uh, when he left town, um, he did not leave a forwarding address. <laughs> yeah. Now, were you one of the people that was a reunion years later and yeah. he came? Yes. When we, when we, uh, the board decided that they were going to do this, uh, reunion and, um, uh, we called it a, uh, cast party. It was in the park. And we brought in, um, I think it was WSBA radio was going to do a broadcast from there. We invited John and his wife. We invited a couple of the other people who, he kind of like had a resident company. There were certain artists that were here every year uh -huh. uh, that, you, that uh, you pretty much saw. If you, if you, if you were a repeat subscriber, you saw certain people in different roles each year. Right, right. You know, one guy was really, really nice. Barney Miller was his name. Uh, played uh, Liza Minnelli's father in Arthur, in the movie Arthur. Oh, okay. Uh, another guy's name uh, uh, was Ernest, Ernie, I'm going to say, not Ernie Young. Can't think of his last name. But there were a couple people that were standard. We got, got the names of some. Brought them in. We thought this is going to be a wonderful idea. We were going to do it as a fundraiser. And if I remember correctly, I think we had maybe 12 people there in the park. That was it. So John was there with his wife and, uh, you know, a couple of the old people, that, a couple of the old stars. It was fun watching them reminisce and get together. But it didn't draw what we were expecting as far as all the old people. Mm -hmm. who remember who remember the, the the what John Cameron did down there and the Legion Playhouse? We were expecting a lot more, and uh, it didn't happen. No. And, and, and uh, besides, a lot of people like what I found out because my friend Alan was, loved to research, and he did a lot of research for me one time uh, with old playbills and stuff. Who had, John McMartin was a big Broadway yeah. actor. He Played at the Playhouse a lot. Yeah, he, he was, he was lot. one of the standards. Yeah, he was John McMartin, um, who's great. I think the last thing he did was um, Ray Gardens. I think he played the grandfather in Ray Gardens. Um, he was a, a very famous actor, and he uh, played there a lot. Then, of course, I think Betty White got her start there. 
um, and um, sort of a lot of, uh, um, I sometimes like, uh, I get uh, letters or visits from all people who met at the play who worked there during that time period and like ran the light board or ushered and they, a lot of like, uh, they, when they were teenagers and they met their wives there and, you know, very nice. Are you going back to the stories about the old hotel again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um. Uh, I remember this one very, very lovely gentleman who came to visit, and he had met his wife there, and they came back to see the place after the renovation. And um, I occasionally get a letter saying that I can't believe it's still there. I have so many memories of the place when I was a kid. Thank you for, you know, making sure that the theater is still there. But he would tell me funny stories, like Veronica, like, I'll never forget this. Like, in Summerstock, oh, it's like, you were either an established star who were kind of not, not working a lot, or you had, you were on your way up or on your way up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Veronica Lake, towards the end of her career, played, and there's a picture of this in the lobby, I think it's still in the lobby, played Maggie the Cat and Cat in the Hot Chin Room. Mm -hmm. She must have been 60. I mean, so <laughs> yeah, I hear that. She was kind of losing it, and this guy would tell me that she would wander off the stage. I thought it was funny. As Maggie, and if you know Cat in the Hot Chin Room, Maggie's on stage all the time. And the first act is just her and Brick talking for an hour. Right. Uh, and then, and Maggie is on, Maggie and Brick are on stage. Every, uh, Maggie actually gets off the second act. But anyway, so she would wander off. She would just wander off stage. <laughs> And the actor who played Big Daddy would go, Rick, where's Maggie? <laughs> and the actor, oh, she had to go to the ladies' room, Big Daddy. <laughs> and Ron would wander off and wander back in. So, um, <laughs> so, so then Cameron left, uh, and the playhouse was kind of in disrepair, right? It was disrepair. And the borough got together, right? And were you involved at that time or was this? No, no, I, I, still, I still wasn't. Um, at the, the borough manager at that time, uh, his name is Carl Fuhrer, and uh, his son was in charge of the committee who, uh, he was, an, arch he was uh, an architect, and he was in charge of a committee of, I, I, probably best to say community leaders, who were running the the building um, up until 1979, so several years after Cameron left, and at that time they um, turned the place over to a guy by the name of Richard Whirl, Whirl who had Gal Muffrey Productions out of York. Uh, right. They were a community theater a, in in York. And uh, they were kind of like a uh, one of the you know the the, the vagabond type place. They had no place to to go for a per permanent home. They performed here, performed there, different places, and um, they came to. And they produced out of there for a while. And produced some wonderful theater. Yes, they were there from uh, seventy nine to eighty three, and really did some great stuff. And I mean, at that time, and when, when people think of the Playhouse and coming to the show to the Playhouse, a lot of them are, are not thinking of the old, like, you know, when, when John Cameron was here, they're looking at the shows that Gallo Murphy did. And they used a lot of really good local actors from uh, Lancaster and York, Reading. They were excellent productions. They really did. Uh, they, their final year, um, they did a lot of local actors like Steve Stesis, Tim and Steve. Yep. Uh, they they got their Claude Denis Diener, who's now in um or Claude and Judy are in uh, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. 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 Uh, he started with Gallimard Production. So a lot of the people who later established the community theater, the base of the community theater artist worked for Gallimard. And a lot of the folks who eventually ended up doing, uh, forming the original Seven Sister group, mm -hmm. they were here too. And right. usually the one show out of the summer 
they turned over to a local organization called SPADE. It was a youth organization and um, I, th I think 18 was the maximum limit for the age group of that, of that uh, troop. And they would come in and, and do one show for a week. And uh, there's a lot of names in that group that went on to local yeah. theater. Barbara was a member of say, Amy Shea. Uh, Kevin Lambert, who's now back, moved to New York, moved back and works at Playhouse now a lot. He was a member of Spade. Yep. It's Repco. There's a lot of people that we started at in the Playhouse EPAC. <laughs> with, with, because it was at the time, was the Cold Playhouse in the park yet after Cameron left? Is that when? Yeah, it was, yeah. The they, after Cameron left, they, they dropped the Legion word and it was just effort of Playhouse. Just the Star Playhouse sounds the effort of Star Playhouse. Effort of Star Playhouse. Right. Yeah. And, and they dropped all that. It, it was just Playhouse in the Park. Right. The Playhouse in the Park. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's they, why it's old time to still refer to it as Playhouse. <laughs> yeah, they did uh, 80, 83, their final year. They did a production of Annie, which was fabulous. You're talking about Gallimaufry. Gallimaufry. Yes. And they, Andy Joe Hill, now a member of our board, played Annie. Played Cynthia Annie. Charles played Grace. And was Claude, Claude Danny Warbucks? Yes. Huh? Yeah, wow. And yeah. it was the, the first time it was produced in the state. So that was like a major feather in the cap. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I have, no, I, I have <laughs> no idea how they swung that, but. Uh, I hope they got the rights and that was just like. <laughs> <laughs> MGI's gonna yeah. send them a bill. <laughs> no, they, they send you the bill. Uh, that's right. <laughs> 50 years ago. <laughs> now, we're just looking at records, and now we heard you and Dave Gilbert are talking, and you never got the right for that show. So, you always... well, they also did a great production of Elephant Man, too. I heard that, and they also did Pippin, too. They did Pippin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They did a lot. And then uh, Claude Denis would tell me a lot because he remembered that, and they pounding on doors to come to the theater. and they did a lot there. And then Gallimaufry left. Do you know why Gallimaufry left? Do you know why? Uh, shall we say artistic differences with the management? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, 1980, the EPAC was formed. Okay. Formed because I have a poster at the office from 1980 that's the effort of performing. The first thing I see that actually says effort of performing arts center. Right. But yet, all the events are all over town. A lot of them were at the train station right here. Like, they'd show silent movies. There were readings. There were concerts. So it was, right. like, not particularly associated with what we know now as the theater. They, the event, the EPAC, their events were all over the town. And it was, uh, well, they managed what was happening. You know, they were, they were the producing organization. Right. So when you, you saw EPAC, and you saw effort of playhouse in the park all in the same letterhead all in the same word one was the producing organization right the, other was the quote like a theater company so to speak but right right yeah, so in the off in the off uh summer yeah epac was all over the place doing various types of theatrical things um but the they hired gala muffrey now, was the reason artistic differences was their work is getting too edgy or? I honestly don't know. I know that they were not hitting it off. Uh, there, were, there was, um, the edginess didn't start then yet. Okay. Uh, there, there was, I know there was, uh, it was, they were doing extremely well. I mean, they were definitely making money and, and right. doing well. Uh, but for some reason, the administration and Gal Muffrey had a parting of ways. Wow. And Gal Muffrey returned to York. Mm -hmm. And then for two seasons, um, the producing organization, EPAC, hired Millersville University. This was under the reign of Paul Talley. Yes. And they came, they came out for two seasons, 84 and 85, uh, did some interesting work. Uh, they had interns, which was part of the program, so that uh, you could, you know, if, as your student, when you're a student in Millersville, you could sign up 
to be a, a summer intern at the Playhouse in the Park under them. The designers were Millersville designers, the directors, they used some community people, but um, it was like Dr. Paul Talley did a lot of, a lot of directing uh, here. So yeah, 84, 85, and then that of course was the infamous turn <laughs> yeah for us yep yep now we're getting to the 80s and i arrived <laughs> wow <laughs> okay <laughs> so yeah because i came down our first show the first show i was involved with was the mousetrap summer of 86 86 so right. was next producing after miller's old two years i guess miller's old just left Gary Smith was yeah. running the place under Miller's for a while. I remember well, that. Gary Smith, well, Gary Smith was managing director for one year in 86. And I did children's theater that year. Uh, and the, the uh, his first year, and, and you were you were hired. Uh, you came in to do... Um, Mousetrap. Mousetrap. I, I wasn't hired because it was uh, I was a volunteer actor. Volunteer. Volunteer, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I remember your interview, your audition, because I was doing, uh, like I said, I was doing children's theater. And at that time, the children's theater program was this uh, mishmash of uh, adults performing for children. And they also, I, I try to convince them that I, what I wanted to do was instead of adults performing for children, I wanted to hire some, some teenagers Right. Have them do the show, and Gary bought into that. But I still went to the auditions with the other directors that were hired. And I remember you coming in and auditioning. And if I remember correctly, you were, you did a Shakespeare piece. I think it was King Lear that you did for your audition piece. Oh, wow. Okay. And I remember sitting there watching the auditions thinking, oh, my God, this guy is from New York. Why is he here? I mean, for, you know, first question, and he's doing Shakespeare. And I was just so impressed. I, 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 I just was. I thought, wow, uh, how about that? Shakespeare, New York, we're, we're, this is amazing. So I was going to try to get your autograph, and I think you left too soon. But, um, yeah, I, re I, remember, I remember your audition. Yeah, and at the time, it was Carl Seipel was managing director, right? You had hired, they had hired him. 86 was was uh, still Gary was Gary. I had never met Gary. Either. I know 86 was Carl. Carl I worked there under Carl. Carl. Yeah, I yeah. worked there under Carl. Gary was I never worked with Gary at EPAC. Yeah, Carl Carl was basically the um he was managing director. Yes, at that at, yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah, so then, and you were a member of the board at that time as well, Dave? Were you up no, I was, I, was just, I, I was just an employee uh, directing. Wow. Okay. 86 is when I did my first children's theater piece. Wow. Okay, so yeah, then. It'd be seven, I, then, and, well, in 86, um, was there, the season that we did that year was after the Millersville group. And I think. You know, the EPAC changed completely between 85 and 86. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Millersville group opened the season of 85 with a piece by Studs Terkel called Working. And uh, it's a great piece, great musical. And yes. Studs, when he put the thing together, interviewed all these people uh, who had all the you know regular normal jobs so to speak firemen police yeah. and that kind of thing and he took their exact responses to the interview to create the dialogue for the music and to create the dialogue for the plays and the music was written by american singer songwriters like uh like famous it was all different like it's almost a review it was almost a review. Like James, uh, what's Taylor wrote a song for it? Like it was written with American, with a, uh, songwriters. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, uh, in working, um, 
I know First the time in Lancaster County, we get the F bomb drop and it happens to be in Ephrata. And it was several times and it was used in, uh, um, I, I remember I was there. I mean, I, and I remember you could, you could hear the collective gasp in the audience. Uh, right after that, the letters to the editor started going into the F review. Uh, that show was followed up with a review called I'm Getting My Act Together. And Heather, to get on the road. Yeah. Which also had the F bomb in it again. So two shows in a row, and it was like major discord with what we were doing in effort. Effort was definitely, you know, people talk about Ed Fernandez doing dirty theater. Um, this was this was it. So EPAC board threw out Millersville. <laughs> and uh, in throwing out Millersville, they they completely went 180 degrees in programming. Yeah. And in 86, I remember the um, uh, Curious Case of the Clockwork Prince, Sherlock yeah. Holmes. And the, it's one of the first shows I saw in EPAC. Yeah. Curious Case of the Clockwork Sherlock Holmes and the Cases of Kids Show, which is a kid's yeah. show. Yeah, it, 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 it ran like 60 minutes. <laughs> the title was as long as the show. It was ridiculous. <laughs> oh. All right, shut up, Alexa. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... What, 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 was that the same year as Saga of Sun, Sand City? That was the following year. Oh, okay. It was 87. <laughs> And the, the, the problem was uh, they, they went the opposite direction because of the number of people who were upset. And I remember in the, the program, um, Welcome, it emphasized the, uh, the artistic, the purpose of EPAC was to meet the artistic needs of the participants and the community while balancing community standards mm -hmm. and that set off several years of overreactive theater yeah and i when i got on the board we were down to 80 subscribers and bleeding money all over the place because <laughs> the attendance the the, the shows um were not attended well. Millersville, great stuff. I mean, Gallon Muffrey had was doing wonderful work. Millersville was doing wonderful work. And then it was like it's all of a sudden a complete turnaround. And you know, we Sherlock Holmes and the clockwork prints and all this. So yeah, it was a it was a major change. And at that point after Millersville, then EPAC became both the producing and the business end of the organization yeah. and start and that was the last time we brought in another group and then that's when i got on the board that was also and, 86 season we also did moose murders yes you did moose murder directed by bob kingston may rest in peace and yeah. moose murders because um and uh i, I had i have the thing i i wrote this down because i didn't want to forget this no um Sherlock Holmes was 87. Oh, really? It was 87? Yeah, I wrote this down because, like I said, I, I'm not even sure what I had for breakfast, so I wanted to make sure I wrote this down. 86. Um, and uh, it was a uh, great gray ghost of oh, old Blue Lane. Lane. Ma major hit. Major Bravo <laughs> hit. And we followed that up with Moose Murders. <laughs> And then 1940s Radio Hour was the musical, front page. Wow. And we finished with Utter Glory of Morrissey Hall. Wow. Well, front page and Utter, Glo Utter Glory of Morrissey Hall, kind of an interesting Broadway flop. Yeah. And front page, well, front page. That, 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 that just... Yeah. And, the, and then the 87 season was Sherlock Holmes and a Curious Adventure of the Clockwork Prince. My first show that I saw there. And then Mousetrap. Which was my show, yeah. 
and then over here that I directed. I remember that. Yeah. Mornings at seven. And Saga of Sand City. Which I missed for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> You were probably doing your wash. I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord! Yeah, and then you so you took over, and you I don't know if this was a joke, if you were exaggerating, to, but you would say that how they would pick the season is during Super Bowl Sunday. They would just open the San French catalog, close their eyes, and go like that. <laughs> it was. It was I was I was told when I got on that they usually picked it during the intermission of a Penn State football game. Because <laughs> they, I, it, it's interesting that the, the background, 80, I was doing in 86, I, like I said, I was doing the, the, the children's theater piece, Rapunzel and the Witch. And at that time, the children's theater wasn't done in the playhouse. It was done down in the bandstand. Okay. So I was down there rehearsing with my cast and I, I used the uh, um, teenagers instead of the adults performing for kids. And I remember that a board member came down during Moose Murders and asked me to please hold it down that my cast was projecting louder than the people on stage and I was bothering the people on stage. There was another night that he came down, same board member, and asked me to stop my rehearsal so my cast could go up and watch Moose Murders because there were only two people in the house that night. No. Yes. No. So oh. I brought my cast to 12. I think I had 10 or 12 with me. And, uh, you know, we had an audience of, le of less than two dozen for Moose Murders that night. Oh, my Lord. So I, I complained to the <laughs> to the board and they said okay we're going to give you a musical for the next season 87 and they gave me over here and i said oh okay um it did quite well on broadway it was the star of the andrew sisters and john travolta john travolta was in there and treat williams who was a f and m student at, and uh was in that it was the subtitle was America's Big Band Musical. I remember that. I remember it was on Broadway. Yeah. So I said, what's my budget? And they said, my music budget was a piano. And I said, it's big band. There's songs referencing trumpets. There's song referencing saxes. I got a, tr I got a, I got a piano. And he said, well, if, if you get a cheap piano player, you might be able to pick up a bass and drums. So I went off and got uh, contacted a good friend of mine, Don Trosel. Don Trosel, man. And Don is, have, at that time, was doing a lot of things at uh, the Fulton for the Kiwanis Club. And I used Don when I used to be executive director of the Miss Lancaster County pageant. Uh, we used Don as our pit band. So I, and Don was my musical director when I did um, a production of Funny Girl at Effort High School. And Don said he could put together an eight piece band for me that I could get some brass and some reeds. And he asked the budget. Well, you know, like $1.98 or something like I said, so I can afford to pay him. So he took it because Don, used to be the music director for John Cameron. Which you can still see his name on the posters for the Leeds yes. Playhouse and yeah. the Upper Star Playhouse, yes. Yeah. So he was, he was kind of thrilled, whoops, what's that? That's something from my phone coming in here. <laughs> There's something to edit. <laughs> yeah, there's something to edit. <laughs> So anyway, he, he, the way he handled this thing was really, was interesting. He decided that he would help me out and he would charge more for future appearances for his pit in order to do it for me. So I got Don, he, I got eight pieces and then somebody who hired Don's band 
somewhere down the road ended up paying ten dollars a night extra to pay for the but so we put together um over here and uh i had the uh one of my um the leads was this young guy by the name of lane Ziner. i remember very well first time i saw lane on screen yep and it was ungodly hot july and of course every you know anybody who played at effort you know the reputation of sweating to death and all oh, i know in the choreography that we had uh ray antonelli did the choreography it's very very good choreography and very tiring very exacting stuff he had the cast that the, the men who were playing the soldiers do push-ups and I remember after the push-ups, when they got up and walked away from the floor, there were these three big wet spots on the floor where, the, where their bodies touched. <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah. it was fun. Yeah. Yep. Was I fun. remember that season. I remember, not to blow our own, pat ourselves on the back, but Mousetrap and over here had a big audience. Yes. I remember playing to Mousetrap, and it was hot. It was hot. And it was packed. And I remember coming to over here and it was packed. So, yeah. Uh, Victor, and we, yeah, yeah. Victor Capici loved over here. Yeah. And he said he, he liked it better than on Broadway because of the editing, that the cutting that we did. We cut out every show at that time had a dream ballet. And I, I cut the dream ballet. <laughs> and uh, he thought that was good. Um, George Hotza from the Reading Eagle uh, reviewed it. Um, he gave it, uh, and then one of his top ten for the uh, for the year in the area. Uh, it 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 sold extremely well. Your sh that show and over here, yeah, made the money for that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, for that show. So right after, right at that time, then um, after I directed there, I kind of complained about this, that, and the other thing. So they said, okay, if you're gonna complain, we want you on the board. So that's when I got on the board. And then I was on the board for probably the next, almost six years. And then I did two shows and were you the board member when I started directing? Were you on the board when I did yes. Gold Dust? Gold Dust, I hired you for that, yes. Yeah. We were because they because Beatrice, the original direct, I had never even thought of directing, like, uh, but I was sort of forced into it. It was odd because <laughs> Beatrice left and she got ill. She the original director of Gold Dust got ill. So they hired, they said Eddie can direct. She's got I never directed, I don't know what to do. And you know, the rest as they say. So I did the first show there, and then the second, it was my first show. Do you remember the thing, if I can, if I can interrupt you, do you know the thing that impressed me most with Gold Dust? Was when you decided to go and sell intermission from your bar that we built for you. Remember? Yeah, near and beer. Yeah. Near beer. Yep. And were people upset? Yes, oh, of course. Because me and you decided we're gonna after gold dust me and you decided we're gonna change this place we're gonna <laughs> change this place. we're gonna do because we're gonna lose some people we took a chance we're gonna lose some people and we're gonna get some people because in gold dust we served near beer during right. intermission during and intermission. It was a very immersive event yes and people complained they're drinking alcohol it was near beer it was non-alcoholic beer well, and then to, you know, we used your the bar we built for you ended up being the bar in the lobby for I don't know how many years. That was the do, you, kind of, do you remember Victor had a painting of Susan who played the saloon keeper over the free lunch he had naked. Yeah, she posed for it, but it was in his imagination. But there was a picture of of you know the old kind of Mae Westy naked picture of yeah, so gold dust to me was nothing. It was very campy. Uh, it was a very campy show. I made it very campy. But um, a lot of people, I remember people just not interested. Some people, some nights, weekends were great. Weekends were great. But during the week when you had your regular people, it was very, uh, you could feel the disapproval in the air. 
And then the next season, of course, I directed again. 88, you directed. And you, talk, and you said we're doing a little shop. And what people don't win, that was the well, real well, turning point. Well, little, little Shop was 90. We had a couple oh, Little Shop was 90? What did it? 80, 87, uh, 87 when I'm, I, I'm looking at my notes here again. 88, we did uh, Funny Thing on the Way to the Forum, which Alan, I believe, Alan directed that, didn't he? Yeah. And we did Round and Round the Garden, uh, Take Me Along, which I did the musical, right. and Godspell. Right, 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 right. That was the 88 season. Um, and 89, we went into company. Right. And Sunshine Boys. I remember that. Uh, Ten Little Indians and Joseph Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat was all when you did Gold Gold. Dust. Yeah. So then the 90s, you said, let's do Little Shop. And what people don't realize at the time, now everybody does Little Shop. They do it for kitty matinees. It was controversial when we did it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our well, sponsors withdrew. They were upset because there was the s and There was illusions of sexuality. There was a uh, violent mock violence. I mean, now Little Shop is everybody loves Little Shop. Kids like Little Shop. At the time that we did it, it was it was quite the risque event. Well, back with what the when I got on the board um, after the shows that we were doing after after the infamous 86 and 87 seasons, um, first thing I did was put myself in charge of a new committee, programming. Right. And I also started a committee on fundraising and chaired both of them. Yeah. And if you remember, we used to meet you and I and, um, Harry Long and Victor, we meet up at the hilltop yeah. and, and talk shows. And I figured, okay, if I'm going to pick a season and have a committee picking the season, I also want to be able to be able to be on the group that's financing that season. All right. So the titles kind of I started playing with a little bit different titles there with you know sticking company in there and form. And we were definitely getting away from Sherlock Holmes and the yep. Prince and all that and that as we were working through there. Um, and then that worked me into uh, the, 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 I still wasn't board president yet, but having those two committees gave me the, you know, it put me in a position to work on, on season. But right. in between there, uh, we were uh, we were going to be closing and not even get into the '90s season. Wow! Because we we lost a lot of money those two years after Millersville, and um, the shows the following two years were not doing. We'd have a couple, you know, like you said, we did some good work with with your show and with over here, but we owed money all over town. Uh, we were building sets with cardboard because the lumber yards wouldn't give us sell us any lumber because we owed them from the last lumber we bought. And it got to the point that um, we had to make some major changes. And it, that was the that was the year then that we um, took the loan out. Uh, which which I got. I don't, uh, you're uh, probably familiar with that one. Uh, I have to mention that because you put your you mortgaged your house. You, yes. That loan. Yeah. We 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 were looking at trying to figure out what we could do. We had a we were uh, maxed out with uh, a personal line of credit. We were max. We were just there was just no way there was we were getting any more money. Uh, my my treasurer Ed Brainerd said uh, suggested that we need to do is get a bill payer loan bill consolidation pay all the bills off pay off everything uh get a lower interest and go over there and i went off to the bank and they said sure what do you have for collateral well my good looks to start off with <laughs> and the ancient light system that you know we use down there yeah, uh, the, 
Borough owned a building, it's not our building. So they said, well, you need collateral. So we talked about it and I talked about it with my wife who had also, along with me, had been way, way back to Gallimuffrey days and all that is, uh, with the theater. So we decided to use our house as uh, collateral to get the loan. And we got the loan. And with that loan and being in a better financial shape, uh, the board made the decision when, through particularly my committee that, okay, we're going to up the, uh, up the ante for the 1990 season. We picked Little Shop, which was new. It was the first, it was the yeah. area premiere of Little Shop. And I also picked one of my favorite plays, House of Blue Leaves. Archie was, Wilson directed it. That was another area premiere mm -hmm. when, we, when we did that one. And I really enjoy musical comedy murders of 1940. Uh, that also was a relatively recent piece. And House of Blue Leaves is a Tony Award winner. Um, musical comedy murders wasn't, but it was, uh, I think it was like the, from the 87 season. Right. So um, armed with those, um, we needed, to, I, what I decided in talking to the board, I convinced them that we needed to do, start with something I want to use the word edgy, something that will gain attention that nobody else is doing. Uh, we need a play. In the, it's entirely different. Yeah, we entirely. need a play in the same vein. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely want to finish up the year with something uh, traditional to show, okay, we're not totally off the wagon here, guys. We can still do something. So I direct that anything goes that year. And then the other musical, what did we do for the other one? Uh, Ernest and Love. Yeah. Ernest and Love was the was the middle musical, which was a chamber piece. Uh, so that season, we made all the all the shows that got great reviews. They show they were uh, played to very strong houses. We were able to go and rebuild our subscription base and kind of established ourselves with that 1990 season as, okay, watch this group grow. This is not your old mm -hmm. playhouse in the park. Watch this group go. Yeah, uh, and off we went. Our sponsors of the little shop were not happy about the show. I mean, this was a very controversial move. It's hard right. for people to realize that now, but we that's when it started to do shows that would get attention and what, is now known as the EPAC. Well, well, the kind of work we present started back in the nineties. Back then, that season that was that was a that was a that was a turning point, and that was a turning point season. And we paid the loan off to we paid the loan off in a year. Yep. Wow. So, and then the next thing that, um, as far as making EPAC, I would jump ahead. I don't know if you were on the board when Deborah Good, who's now Deb Ziner, was for a while we no, did it. I was I I I was I left the board um I think like 93 right uh, 90 and it, so I wasn't on when, when Deb was the president I uh I was on from of course uh who took off after me uh Peggy uh was Peggy, Peggy was Peggy. board president for a while yeah Hello. Now, you on the board that hired Michael Severide when Michael Severide came in as our artist because we had Mike Severide as artistic director. Yes. Matt, it, we did. I was the first artistic director. Before that, it was just managing director. Producer. It was many. It was managing director, right? And uh, yeah. Severide was Michael Severide was in for three years, I believe. It was Peg, and uh, then I, I believe it was right after Peg. I think that's when we hired Michael Severide. I was and I was on the board, and I remember sitting doing the uh, interviews and looking over the interviews, the uh, resumes that came in, and seeing Michael Severide, Father Eric Severide, CBS News correspondent, and I remember thinking, 
going back to this Ed Fernandez from New York City. Here we're, you know, we're drawing somebody again here, uh, who I'm wondering how are they finding Ephrata. And it, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was a when, when so I think Ted uh, um, after several rides, we still were playing with still trying to move to a more modern theater approach, more edgy, more uh, uh, evocative. Yes. And, um, we, did it, we were still censoring back then. And we did assassin. I don't know mm -hmm. how I told the board to do assassin, but we were doing assassin. And we passed, Sean was on the board, Terry Heller, and assassins, Deb pushed through a no censorship act. That a uh, bill that if we were going to do a show, and if we picked a show, we were not going to we stand behind the content. We would not censor it. So we did assassins, and with f bombs included. We did it. We did it because the first time we did Chicago, which itself was a big oh my god, they're doing Chicago, which was considered then a very dirty show. We censored a little of the language, not much, but a little bit of the language. But uh, after Assassins, no more censorship. And that was, Deb Good was in charge. She, as she said, no more censorship. We pick a show, we stand behind show artistically. Do not censor. Right. Don't want to do it, we don't pick it. So that was the next big, uh, the big forward, leap, artistically, the big forward leap. And then, of course, came the renovation. You were not on the board for the renovation, Dave. No, I wasn't on the board, um, but I was on the development committee. Uh, no. Sean asked me to help with the fundraising. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that was... That's, that's where I was going back and forth between board and committee of the board. Yeah, and you, were, you were always there. Like, I don't remember a time when you were not like, on the board. In my mind, you were always on the board. <laughs> and then you recently became, it were on the board, uh, you were reelected to the board a couple of years. Right. Uh, well, I was on the board under um, uh, Jim Ruth. I was on the board with JP, on the board with Rich. I mean, it was quite a few, quite a few years. I was back again working and right. And yeah. and now this is um, yeah. This was only the second time that I was that I was uh, president. president. Yeah. Yeah. Well. You've come a long way, baby, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sean put three you notes. Know, so there was you, me, Sean, Cherry Heller, uh, a couple of people that really, you know, had the energy and the vision to move forward. And it was hard. We lost a lot of people. I mean, we put up with play. It wasn't overnight. You know, um, back in the day, it was a real fight to do the material we would do in small increments. We, had, we didn't all of a sudden wake up I mean, like nudity on stage, and you know, it was small increments that we pushed through, and we got slack. I mean, it was not all smooth sailing, you know. But we just, I mean, when we did Kiss the Spider Woman, I had anonymous Bibles mailed to me. I mean, it, it was uh, little by little, and um, until you know, and it was a matter of audiences who don't want to see that or not coming to. Place and people who do want to see that are, are, are coming in. And I think a lot when I talk about um, when I talk about the pro artistic progression that we've made, the progressiveness of our vision, I really think cable had a lot to do with it. I really think HBO, because it was in the same period where people would bring that into their homes, that kind of HBO would present adult material in people's living rooms, and people started watching HBO at home which would affect what they would take in the theater, you know, which, because we had to keep up with what people was popular, what people were watching, you know? Right. So I think it all had to do with how the entertainment industry in general had, had, had um, especially television, had moved forward. Um, that and allowed I, us to move forward too. I, I, I think also we did a lot to build trust. Yes, we did. Uh, because if you saw a show at EPAC and you might 
cringe slightly but at, at something that was said or something they saw. They trusted us to come back for the next show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there might be, um, I, I, I can think of the number of people that would have possibly gotten up and walked out years ago. That kind of didn't happen. Uh, yeah. People, they, they been, might mention something that, oh, that was a little over the top, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Are you coming? To, are you coming? That, that one next? Yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, so we'll we'll be there. I think they just trusted us enough that even if they somebody would be offended to use the term, they didn't give up the subscription. They came back and looked at the next thing we were doing, and I and I think just trusted us that okay, these people know what they're doing. The programming is important. It is, yeah. it is meaningful. And yeah. like I said, combining with what was happening with entertainment in general, um, we, were, we were just moving right along with the, with the way society was viewing entertainment differently. Right. Totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. We broke the press of it. Yeah. We were, we were, and we weren't afraid. It took a lot of bravery back then. Um, but we weren't afraid to because... Um, you know, uh, we weren't afraid to, you know, break uh, the envelope. We weren't afraid to do that, you know. And I and I think I, I when I was on the board, the early board there, and I look back at those two seasons where we tried to, we overreacted uh, with the material. And I thought back to some of the really, really good stuff that Gallimuffrey did and some of the things that, that Millersville did. Um, they were, we, we couldn't throw that away. We couldn't throw those shows away. Uh, we, we could not continue on a model of solid all G rated. Children's Theater. Children's yeah, theater. yeah, yeah. We, we couldn't. We had to go back and pick up some of those pieces that were modern, that were contemporary, that had meaning and affected people. And also at the, at, at the time we offered, at the time, we offered an entertainment that nobody else offered. Like we offered like Broadway, what people would see when they went to New York, that kind of right. material. We would offer it here when no, nobody else was doing it. Well, we didn't have their upstage. And, it was basically Victorian drama, Victorian, you know. And, um, and, and recycle Rodgers and Hammerstein. Recycle Rodgers and Hammerstein, and nobody yeah. was doing this stuff. I remember when we did Chicago, uh, people called it a filthy musical. We were known as Z-Pack Bums. You know, people are, you know, just really, you know, we, you know, some people really just resented the fact of what we were doing. And yeah. it was a hard road. And now, Everybody's doing it. <laughs> well, and, and I think also it wasn't always just the the language, but even and shows that I would not even consider thematic. Um, I think just the, some some of the community just had to catch up to us. I know when uh, Effort of High School did a production of um, Fiddler in the Roof, the director got a letter complaining about the show, saying it was too Jewish. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, we're not talking about language there. Uh, you know, but I also think it helped um, when we started to expand our audience base also uh, into Lancaster City and to Berks County. We started to draw because we were getting reviews. Yes, we're getting a lot of reviews in Lancaster City, and we get reviews. Uh, the Reading Eagle started reviewing, so we. It, I think it really helped us too that we broadened our audience base. With we pull from Linux, Lebanon. You know, the one good thing about uh, EPAC is it's sort of centrally located to Berks County, Lancaster City, Lebanon, Linux. It's like we can draw. Drive it's a drive to community. Right. We can draw from all those places. So. And, um, it's interesting when you think of it too, historically, um, going back decades, it's, it's been Ephraim. 
Uh, the, you know, the Fulton at the time that I was doing attending stuff with John Cameron, the Fulton was doing movies. Yep. B movies. And they do like they a friend of mine who I worked with told me grew up here said that's where you do the universal werewolf movies. It was like yeah. the well, and, they, and they also were doing some art house movies too. Oh really? Yeah. Well and Gene yeah. Clemson was really responsible for you like oh. Right. So <laughs> when you know, so when you look at continuous theater over decades in Lancaster County, it's uh, even the region. It's us. I mean, I, I remember going to the the major uh, theater in Berks County at that time was not Genesius. They weren't around. Uh, it was the uh, Reading Civic Opera Society. It was called the Opera, which is now Reading Civic Theater. It used to be the Reading right. Civic Opera Society. And and they did musicals. That was it. They And they, it, they weren't anything like a cutting edge musical. You know, they were doing musicals. Rodgers and Hammerstein, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so if you go back history wise, going back to Cameron, it's EPAC. We're, we've been consistent, the consistent theater company. Right. Uh, all that time, which well, is quite a, hit, quite a history. It's funny to see um, pictures of Cameron Day. We have tons of pictures of Cameron Day. Some of them aren't really visible in our productions. And you just pick a famous person out. There were no set no scenes around, so there were no set. And sometimes you see a set piece that we still have sitting around, <laughs> which I think is very funny. Like there's like 50 year old photos of Can Can, and oh, we still have that chair. Oh, we still have that table sitting around. And there were no sets because there's theater in the round. There were no walls. Right. So it's just furniture pieces. So, wow. Well, Dave, we've talked. I knew we were going to talk for a while, and we did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for skipping down memory lane for me and filling in the blanks and what a rich history that we have there. So, and hopefully we'll, well, we will be back to continue the legacy. Certainly looking forward to it. Certainly looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for, thank you for not only for spending time with me today, but thank you for all the energy and love and time and money that you have put into the playhouse. I know it is your love and if it wasn't for you, who knows what would have happened. So God bless you for that. Thank I you. always tell you that and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> All right. Take care now. Be safe, be well. Thank you everybody for listening to us today and God bless you and be safe and be well. Bye-bye.